Seven years ago, I revealed that I have five Plastic Orc War Bosses that I've just accumulated as a result of buying old bags of Plastic Orc plots on eBay. Today I'm going to take one of the ones that arrived partially painted and see how quickly I can make it look like it belongs in the rest of my army. Seven years ago? What have I been doing with my... D&D is morally deficient. The dra well, Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons. It's spiritually corrupt. It is educationally evil. It teaches evil, and it is potentially dangerous. Amazing monster. Far out gate. Now I am making your silver pants blue. So looking at the two of them together, you can see that the one on the left is pretty far from a completed model, especially if you look at the back of it where it's almost entirely black, broken up only by a couple of thin muddy coats of brown. Mine is on the right. I designed him to double as a pain boy, so he has a hypodermic needles on his shooda and a big red cross motif. While I think my skill as a painter has grown a lot in the last seven years, I'm still pretty happy with the job I did here. Highlights on the skin are a little chalky, and that's because I dry brushed them on where a uh, yellow glaze would have produced a smoother result. And I can pick things apart about it, but uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed to play with it. Because if something doesn't show as much growth as you'd like, it can be embarrassing to play with, especially in front of other people. <laughs> this silver bird thing I keep showing to the camera is a Sturge by Citadel Miniatures. It came in a pack of Dungeons & Dragons starter monsters by Citadel back in 1985, which makes it older than Amber Heard and also less of a mythical bloodsucker. He'll be acting as a squidgen or a baby squighawk. If you know anything about squig lore, you'll know they're highly morphogenic, and since this is a Citadel model, this would actually be tournament legal. I'll be using it to replace the skull on his shoulder as a way to differentiate him from the other war boss so I can use them together and there's less of that monopose vibe. I'll keep that skull for another project down the road. I want to do all my modifications on the model before I even pick up a paintbrush. I'm sticking him on the shoulder with a very strong industrial adhesive that I'm almost out of, which is a bummer because this stuff works very well, but it is very expensive. Next thing I'm going to do is drill out the gun barrel. I'm using a pin vise here. Definitely recommend going this route over a Dremel tool. His gun is a little lackluster for a war boss, so let's employ one of these Hero Quest bookshelf skulls to jazz it up a bit. One of the wires on the power claw is broken, and instead of trying to fix it, which could be a real project, I'm just going to strip it away, which is much easier, and will be another difference between him and the other war boss. Again, we start with clippers and finish with the X-Acto blade. Now I'm going to flock the base with PVA glue, bits of cork for stone, and craft sand, although these days I am using a mix that's 95% coffee grounds and only 5% craft sand. I know a lot of people paint their bases and models separately. Are you one of these people? Can you leave a comment and tell me why you do that? It just seems so much more complicated to do it that way. Okay, it is time to color our world with our imaginations. The other one is primed in black, which is something I used to do for every mini for probably the first 15 years of being in the hobby. I had a, a system I stuck to that certainly got paint on miniatures, black undercoat, and then just the application of layers, paying little attention to coverage and transparency, and then I'd dry brush on top of that, and then I'd sort of glop paint on top of little highlights to sort of pick them out. Uh, I definitely could have used some instruction of the kind that's available on painting channels today to point me in the right direction because I was the only mini painter in my gaming group when I started out. And while I churned out a lot of stuff that I loved at the time, when I look at it now, I cringe myself into a ball of primordial goo. I'm not saying I'll ever win a golden demon, but I can display my current stuff without embarrassment. And that's also not to say that black isn't a good primer color. It can be, it's just not the right fit for every model every time, and I rarely use it these days. It's just so much work to bring colors back up to their value when they have to cover black, and the more transparent that paint is, the more time and effort it takes. One workaround is to do a white dry brushing onto your model before you start painting, but 
Again, I'd rather just start with a whiter gray spray primer and then do a wash on the undercoat to define the shadows. I'm going to spend some time on this model just counteracting the black undercoat. The weird white arm came in a bag of bits and I just slapped it onto this model because at least it had paint on it. I don't think it came with this war boss necessarily. While I'm here, let me ring the base on my other orc war boss so it looks like the rest of my force too. Not sure what I was thinking when I left it this way originally. There are some good things on this model. These stripes on the belly armor and power claw are better than I think I could do. I have a steady hand, but I have trouble making identical stripes like this, so I'm not going to mess with that at all. There's a lot of black patches on this model that just weren't painted past the priming, and the, there's a lot of detail that's hiding in there that I'll have to paint to bring it out. Since the Sturge is such a weird shape for a squig, I'm going to just paint it in the classic squig colors. If you're enjoying this video, please give a like and a subscribe. If you'd like to see pictures of this video, why not head over to our Facebook page? We've got a great little community there. Over a thousand members already. Really nice folk. It's got all kinds of pictures of past projects. If you've missed a video, if you'd like to see something there. A uh, great place to talk to me and say hey and reach out. I've also got an Instagram. Uh, if you'd like to support this channel, a great way is to go over to our eBay store where I'm selling all kinds of miniatures. Pre-painted, some hand-painted stuff. Most of the hand-painted stuff that I have up there right now is just painted to a tabletop standard. It's not my best work. It's not stuff I put a ton of time in. But if you'd like just like a lot of works really cheap or a lot of goblins really cheap, uh, just go ahead and grab them. If you've seen anything on this channel that you'd be interested in purchasing, you can hit me up on Facebook, DM me here. Uh, at some point, it will end up on the eBay store anyway. So, uh, great thing to follow. You can go to the eBay store, follow me there. As well. For the base, I'll be sticking to my normal formula, which is either cinnamon or burnt sienna, or a mixture of the two. As the base coat on the base, I then highlight with turner yellow. I think ochre yellow is very similar to turner yellow, so that'd be a good substitute if you have that. And then I like to put in a shadow using espresso colored alcohol ink, which leaks into everything. It's basically a wash. Uh, it gives a nice little stain, but it's especially dark in the recesses. It's just a really nice effect. Any of the cork stones, I just do with gray and then maybe like a lemonade or white highlighting on. Also give them a shadow as well. For my orc skin, I, I do, as I've commented before, I do prefer a brown wash to a blue one or a dark green one. I know they sell dark green washes that are intended for orcs, I don't think it looks that good. I think a brown wash uh, looks obviously dirtier and a little more natural. It gives it more of an organic appearance. And then on this orc for the highlights, I think I either use a very thinned out yellow paint or I might even have gone with a yellow ink. I've got a, a nice yellow ink. And just thin that out, let it rest on the highlighted areas and dry out. It's just a really nice effect because it's transparent. It's hard to see where those barriers are, where the borders are. Um, something where if you thin out sometimes an acrylic paint, you can see the individual pigments. It can end up a little bit chalky. Although, you know, a, a paint glaze, don't listen to me. A paint glaze is fine. You can absolutely go that way, especially if you have a medium instead of with a water. I'm kind of kicking myself. One of the things I did miss on this miniature was I left a mold line on the Hero Quest skull. I guess I was in a bit of a hurry. So you can see that at the end there. I also might have taken like a bit of twine or something to maybe tie the Hero Quest skull to the gun. It's just, I wasn't trying to kill myself with the sculpting. This was more about sort of putting paint on a model just to get it to match and not really trying to make like the coolest or or boss in the world. For his little banner, I'm just going with a neat little blue color and then I'm going to use silver uh, and do kind of a, a stippling effect around the edge of the silver to make it look like it's breaking through, like it's chipping, so his little banner is painted. Uh, the fur that's hanging from the banner, I'm just going with a red to yellow gradient, uh, something I work uh, with a lot, especially when you put one near some blue. It looks really cool. Blue and orange is always a classic combination. All right, let's see how these two turned out. I 
I think it came out pretty good. The two certainly look more cohesive together than they did at the beginning. What do you think? Do they look more cohesive now than they did at the beginning? Why not leave me a comment and let me know what you would have done differently? Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.